The reenactments and commentary in this program may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Pow, kazam, and wham. No, it's not the soundtrack from that old Batman TV series. It sounded more like the defense yesterday, punching holes in the story of the accuser. I'm James Curtis. This is a special one-hour edition, our exclusive coverage of the Michael Jackson trial. Defense attorney Tom Mesro continues his cross-examination of the accuser, and he wants to know who provided the accuser his sex education, if you will. Here's what the jury heard according to the courtroom transcripts. On Thursday, you testified about how you learned what masturbation was. Remember that? I believe so. Pardon me? I believe so. Okay. And you testified that Mr. Jackson told you what masturbation is, right? Uh-huh. Is that true? Yes. And you testified to the jury that Mr. Jackson said that if men don't masturbate, that they can get to a level where they can, might, rape a girl. Remember that? Uh-huh. Do you remember saying that? Yes. Do you remember being interviewed by the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Department on a number of occasions? Yes. And do you remember who interviewed you? Most likely Steve Robel or Paul Zellis. Do you remember being asked, before we get started on the next set of questions, can you describe to us what your opinion is, what you think masturbation is? Do you remember one of the sheriffs asked you that during an interview? I believe so. And you knew those interviews were being recorded, right? Yes. Remember you said my grandma explained it to me. She told me that you're the only reason is because like if if men don't do it, men might get to a point where they might go ahead and rape a woman. Do you remember saying that to the sheriffs? I believe so. Why did your story change between that interview and your testimony last Thursday? Well, what do you mean by change? Well, you told the police your grandmother made that quote to you and you came into court under oath and told the jury Mr. Jackson made that quote to you. They, that didn't change because Michael tried to explain to me first and I, he was more pushing on me than that men have to masturbate. Now later when I came back from Neverland, I guess my grandmother saw that I was very confused about sexuality and things like that and my grandmother explained to me a lot of things. So it just so happened that after Mr. Jackson told you if a man doesn't do it, they may get to a point where they rape a woman, your grandmother made the almost identical quote to you? Is that what you're saying? <sighs> not really. She didn't make the same exact thing that Michael said, but I'm not exactly sure what my grandmother said. I know my gra grandmother explained a lot of things to me. Okay, aside from the contradiction, your grandmother's talking to you about sex. We'll deal with that in just a moment. A programming note in the meantime, this actor who's hired to do our reenactments bears no resemblance to the actual accuser. Back to the courtroom action as Tom Mesro continues to hammer away at more possible contradictions. But what you're telling the jury is it was sort of a coincidence that both your grandmother and Michael used almost the identical phrase about raping a woman. Both my grandmother and Michael were trying to talk to me about the pretty much the birds and the bees story. Okay, and they pretty much said the identical thing. Is that what you're telling me? Not exactly. Not exactly? No. Well, the quotes are almost identical, aren't they? You see, Michael was trying to tell me that I have to masturbate. My mom, my grandmother was actually telling me, giving me the talk. Michael was just talking about masturbation. But your grandmother said to you, if men don't do it, men might get, a po get to a point where they might go ahead and rape a woman, correct? <sighs> Michael also told me that. Well, so you're saying they basically said the same thing. My grandmother said it's okay to do it because sometimes some men, they can't control themselves and might do that. But in that police interview, you never mentioned that Michael Jackson had said that to you, did you? I'm sure in one of the other transcript I mentioned about Michael. Not in that interview, correct? But I'm sure in another one I did. All right, folks, this is huge to say the very least, and I apologize for my Batman analogy, but this is a Mack truck through the prosecution's point, isn't it? This is, I think, the highlight of the day for me. Uh, there are many things that follow, yes. and there are many things that other people have looked at to look at what was the great moment. But I really think that the chances of Michael Jackson and the grandmother using the same phrase to express why one must masturbate yeah. to not rape a woman, this... the chances are just so infinitesimally small. To me, this is the defense just can kind of take a breath and just let the jury have this sink in. Howard, you don't agree. 
Well, I, I, <laughs> Ricky, I was kidding. Ricky is much kinder than me. Yeah. The kid is lying. I think it's very clear he's lying. This is what cross-examination cross is all about. The Batman analogy is perfect here. Truth and justice. That's what Tom that's Mesero. That's what Tom Mesero is fighting for and bringing. I love it. Yeah. I love it. And and you know, not only does it demonstrate that he's lying, but it shows his willingness to stick with this ridiculous story, even as his, as it's revealed. There's no way the grandmother and Michael Jackson used this outrageous analogy. If but indeed now the grandmother even said this, course, I'm thinking back. Not. You know. I'm thinking back to my grandma and all the grandmothers that I know talking to your grandson about masturb masturbation. Well, that, you did, you did just, not, just stopping also, at that point. But you did me. not live in this family. So, you know, he may not have wanted to go to his mother. He didn't have a father figure. Maybe he did go to his grandmother. But let's assume, for the sake of argument, that his grandmother is the person who said this. Somebody said this. I've got to assume he just didn't make it up. Somebody uh, said yes, it. Yes, it's in a transcript. You think he made it up altogether? I, I think he and his brother made it up. I, I can just see this. Grandma, I was wondering, could you talk to me about <laughs> masturbation? Come on, yeah. it doesn't make sense. Well, you know, any the grandmother's going to yeah. testify. But, but, but it's very point, interesting. Well, she, she's part of the family. Yes, indeed yeah, she is. Yeah, but Ricky's point is one well taken. We don't know what this family is about, how they talk to one another. Certainly, it may have indeed happened that way. But let's take another point here, a rather legalistic one. I don't want to get too technical, but it's something called discovery. Tom Sneddon, the prosecutor, knew about this statement to the cops. This statement was made, according to Tom Mesro, not objected to by, uh, not objected to by Snedden, to the police about the grandmother using the same phrase. Well, and we've seen this time and time again, and you see you've come around because we mentioned this last week. I have not come anywhere, week, thank you very much, young lady. Where we said how outrageous it is that Mr. Yeah. Snedden didn't see this coming and prepare for it in some way, and you said that Mr. Snedden didn't have time. Well, no. Of I, course he did. Okay. Of course well, he Mr. had time. Mr. Snedden is stuck. I mean, I, I don't want to be the apologist here for the prosecution, but I do think that we need a voice that says some of the things that the prosecution uh, may be doing correctly. He doesn't have a choice. I mean, he's got these facts as they are. He knows what they are. He can go forward and have his witness say he did it to both, or he can wait for Mesereau. Probably we would have gone forward and put it in first, but nonetheless, it's just a, it's a strategy choice. Mr. Snedden has strategy. a choice. He didn't have to prosecute the case. Okay, that's there another issue. That's we'll get into that in a case. moment, I'm sure, as we go along here today. Bad day for the prosecutor, no matter how you look at it, I think. Next, the biggest bombshell of all at this trial. Did Mr. Snedden ever tell you he had conducted an interview with a Mr. Alpert on Saturday? No, he did not tell me that he conducted an interview. Okay, did he ever tell you he had spoken with Mr. Alpert? Yes. And what did he say about that? He asked me about Mr. Alpert. Okay. What I knew. And did he ask you if you ever had a meeting with Mr. Alpert, correct? Yes. And you told him you did, right? Yes. You told him you met... I told him that I'm pretty sure I did. I did, because I didn't really remember too good. You didn't remember too good that you had told Mr. Alpert that Mr. Jackson had never touched you sexually? Well, I believe it happened because he was a dean of the school, and so I'm pretty sure I had a conversation with him. Okay. And did you tell Mr. Snedden you were pretty sure you had had a conversation with Dean Alpert at John Burroughs School? Yes. Did you tell Mr. Snedden approximately when you had that discussion? No. Did Mr. Snedden ever ask you when you had that discussion? No. Where did the discussion with Dean Alpert take place? I don't remember. It was probably in his office. Okay. And the purpose of the discussion was what, if you know? It was probably about Michael. Okay. You say, probably about Michael? Uh-huh. But you're not sure. I'm not sure what the whole conversation was about. Okay, but sometime in that conversation, Dean Alpert looked you in the eye and said, are these allegations that Mr. Jackson sexually abused you true, right? Uh-huh. And you said they were not true, right? Yeah. Yeah, I told him that Michael didn't do anything to me. Okay, Mr. Alpert asked you twice whether or not Michael Jackson had ever done anything of a sexual nature to you, correct? I don't know if he asked me twice. Well, the first time he asked you, you shook your head no, right? I don't know. And the second time he asked you, you said to him, no, he did not touch me in any sexually inappropriate way, correct? I don't know. You don't know? I'm pretty sure I told him that. Okay. But I mean, I don't know how exactly it happened. 
A lot of I don't know is coming up, Howard Weitzman, and this information with respect to this teacher apparently coming over the weekend. Yes, and it's something none of us knew about. Yeah. As I understand, it was volunteered by the lawyer for the teachers, which is really interesting because they watched what was taking place, and I think they knew this kid was less than truthful, and they wanted that information out there, and they talked with both the prosecutor and the defense. And, Sean, later on, we're going to see and hear about testimony, potential testimony at least, about this kid's past at this school how does that play, and what does that have to do with this case? Why is it hidden there? Well, one, he has disciplinary problems, which shows him to be troubled. And, of course, Mr. Mesereau is going to say that that's going to lead to him being a liar in this case. But it also, as we're going to see later on, it shows that this is a kid who stands up to his teachers. And if he's somebody who stands up to his teachers, is he really the shrinking violet um, who is going to endure abuse by an adult that's, like that's, Mr. That, Jackson? That's an excellent point. Ricky, but, hold but, on. Okay. Hold on, hold on just a second. I got to take this break. Mm -hmm. But the idea of confrontation really comes uh, to the fore as we continue with a teacher's testimony or testimony about a teacher and letters to Daddy Michael. Stay with us. The reenactments and commentary in this program may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back. The defense continues with more rough and tumble cross-examination of this teenage accuser. Here's what the jury heard according to the courtroom transcripts. Okay. Now, based on what you've already said, you also discussed a teacher named Geralt, right? Yes. When I started asking you questions about your discussion with Mr. Snedden, the first person you mentioned was Mr. Geralt, correct? Yes. Mr. Geralt was also a teacher at the school, right? Yes. Okay, and in summary, you had some disciplinary problems with Mr. Geralt, right? I had a lot of disciplinary problems. Excuse me? I had a lot of disciplinary problems. You had a lot of them? Uh-huh. What disciplinary problems did you have? I would get into fights sometimes at school. Pardon me? I would get into fights sometimes at school. Okay, you got into a lot of them, didn't you? Not a lot. I got into a few. Okay, and were you ever asked to leave the school? No, I don't think so. Were you ever asked to leave class? Yes. Okay, and approximately when did that happen? Um, well, a lot of teachers at John Burroughs Middle School, once anyone even talks out of turn, they'll send you out of class. Well, you got up in class and accused Teacher Gerald of having his balls in his mouth, right? His balls in his mouth? Yes. No, because I was never in one of his classes. Do you deny doing that? I don't even remember ever doing that. Next, bad attitude or a brave boy? Now, you said you were accused of being on drugs, right? Yes. And you say that was false, right? Yes. I don't. We'll never go on drugs. Okay, who accused you of being on drugs? Mr. Geralt. Okay, and did he ask you if you were on drugs? He was doing it in a way that he was trying to make fun of me. Were you escorted away from the other students at one point? <laughs> During the detention? Yes. Actually... All the students in there were kind of cheering me on because they all knew how Mr. Geralt is, and no one's ever stood up to him before. And you stood up to the teacher, right? I was already standing up, so... Excuse me, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. I guess so. You did stand up to Teacher Geralt, right? Yes. You confronted him, right? Yes, after he had brought himself down to my level by doing those things, by not... See, because I believe teachers are higher than me because I'm just a student. When a teacher does something like that and makes fun of me and tries to say I'm on drugs, he's no longer the level of a teacher. He comes down to my level. And you were angry about that, right? Um, I felt as if he was... didn't deserve respect as a teacher. Didn't deserve respect as a teacher? No. Okay, so you did not respect him because you didn't think he deserved it, right? I didn't respect him as a person. And you told him that, didn't you? I didn't tell him in those exact words. Pardon me? I didn't tell him, I don't respect you. I didn't tell him in those exact words. It gets worse and worse, it would appear, for this kid on the stand. Ricky Kleeman, I want to make, let you make your point. But also, we start off with him telling one teacher that Michael didn't do anything to now standing up to a teacher, furthering this issue of the discipline problem. 
it's getting worse. Well, I think it's getting worse. I'm going to give it to you quickly on both sides. I will say this, that a kid who may stand up to one teacher about issues that have nothing to do with alleged sexual abuse may not want to tell anyone else, another teacher, a principal, a dean, a relative about sexual abuse. But putting that aside, the fact that he is so tough here with this teacher, it shows a lack of respect. And we have to remember who's on this jury. You have people on this jury who have been teachers, yeah. and they will have their own assessment of what he is and, saying. And it also shows a different side of this boy that we haven't seen. They've put him out here as this sick, weak, you know, cancer patient. And now we see this confrontational student when the other students wouldn't stand up to this teacher. He's the but, one who did. But, Howard, can't you take that very same set of facts, having dealt with victims of sexual assault as a prosecutor, you get a lot of what the experts call acting out. When kids, especially being a victim of uh, this horrific disease, cancer, and if he is a molestation victim, you get that kind of aberrant behavior, behavior based on things that happen to the kid, not just because he's a knucklehead. Yes, however, what you're seeing live uh, and in real time is Tom Mesero putting the pressure on this kid to bring out his real attitude and the jury has the opportunity to see this kid in my opinion for who he is this is a witness you have to put pressure on and what you're seeing is a, a, a defiant attitude well, a confrontational attitude with the attorney in the courtroom in front of the jury and there's more to come there is more to come but will it inure will it help the prosecution insofar as they will be able to come back and say look this is a kid who's had a rough life and this is what happens to kids who don't have a really good childhood now the defense though switches the line of questioning from the accusers school to his affectionately worded communications with michael jackson okay have you had a chance to look at that document yes does it refresh your recollection about your sending a card to michael jackson that said i miss you daddy michael yes Okay, how often would you send cards or letters to Michael Jackson? I'd probably send them maybe once a month or something like that. And you used to ask him for his phone numbers, right? He would give me some of his phone numbers. Pardon me? He would give me some of his phone numbers. He gave them. But correct me if I'm wrong. Did you tell the jury last week that he gave you phone numbers that ended up not working? No. I told you he gave me phone numbers, and after a while they didn't work. And you would then routinely ask him for numbers that did work, right? Not really routinely, but I mean, I asked him. Okay. Do you know approximately when you began sending letters or cards to Michael Jackson? Probably when the numbers didn't work no more, and all we had was Evie to talk to. Do you remember sending a letter to Michael Jackson that said, I love you, Daddy Michael, and tell my little brother and little sister that I love and care about them. Thank you for everything, Daddy Michael. Thank you for being my Daddy Michael. Thank you for helping me beat, be happy and beat cancer. Do you remember sending him a letter like that? Not really, but I mean, I probably did. Now the question has to become, was it the accuser's family who actively pursued Michael Jackson and not the other way around? Do you recall ever writing to Michael Jackson about his injuring his foot? Yes. And tell the jury what you told Michael Jackson about that. I just told him, like, I hope he feels better or stuff like that. You told him that your family was praying for him, true? I think so. You said you felt sorry about his foot being broken, right? Yes. And you said you couldn't wait till you could play at Neverland again, right? Yes. You called him daddy in that letter, right? Yes, I believe so. Is that true? I don't know. But I'm pretty sure I did. Okay. You reminded him that he keeps all of his promises, right? Yeah. He would tell me he keeps every promise he says. Okay. And you reminded him of that in your letter at one time, right? Yes. These cards that I just showed you, letters and cards, you started sending them shortly after you met Mr. Jackson, correct? Well, not really, because I think we... I think I started wanting to send the cards when Michael wasn't talking to me anymore. When he wasn't talking to you anymore? Yeah. And approximately when do you think he wasn't talking to you anymore? Two months into my cancer. Excuse me? Two months into my chemotherapy. Approximately when would that be? August or September of 2000. Okay, so August or September of 2000, you and your family started sending nice letters and cards to Michael Jackson, correct? Yes. And those are the letters and cards that I showed you a little while ago, right? 
Yes. And it was your understanding your mother used to send him cards and letters as well, right? I think so. And she used to refer to him as daddy, didn't she? I don't think she referred to him as daddy. <laughs> you never heard her say that once? Well, toward me, me saying that. Because, I mean, my dad had left, and I started calling him daddy after my dad left because I didn't have a dad. And your mother approved of that, correct? Yeah. Howard, if this is true, this language in these cards, and it's not his true feelings, and when I say if this is true, we know the language is in the cards. If it's true that he wrote this and either doesn't remember or didn't really write it or some combination thereof, what does it say about the insincerity or the sincerity of this kid? My opinion is he used the words to ingratiate himself with Michael and get as much as he could from Michael. Now, is that something that, again, because of the rather unique situation this kid is in, he's experiencing cancer, going through these horrific treatments, which we all know, based on people that we've known who've had them, is got to be one of the toughest things physically and emotionally for anybody to go through. So, so is he going to get? Is he going to be? Uh, is he going to look bad to these jurors because of this kind of thing? No, not necessarily. I think that he looks bad because Tom Mesereau gets him at various points in time where it appears that he has lied. But here, the fact that he ingratiated himself with Michael Jackson, he also wanted this kind of affection coming back to him. I think that's a normal thing for a kid to want, let alone one who has an illness. And not returning that affection maybe ricocheted and uh, uh, made him in, put him in this situation. Yeah, that's what we're going to see later. Everything turns. He's feeling affection for Michael Jackson. But then he feels abandoned by Michael Jackson. And is and that, that the motivation the exactly. for what we see here playing itself out in this courtroom? When we return, Jay Leno's name is dropped. And folks, it's no joke. Stay with us. <laughs> <laughs> Reenactments and commentary in this program may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back. With the accusers still on the stand, questioning moved from the king of pop to the king of late night. Here's how the teenager responded according to the courtroom transcripts. Okay. Did Mr. Snedden ask you to testify that Jay Leno was your favorite comedian? No. Okay. When did the idea that Jay Leno was your favorite comedian come up in this case? Well, Jay Leno was my favorite comedian, but I don't really understand what... Do you remember calling Jay Leno on the telephone? I remember calling, yeah. I remember calling his phone. Do you remember speaking with Jay Leno on the telephone? No, I never spoke with Jay Leno. At any time? No. Did you ever try to reach Jay Leno on the telephone? Yes. And who did you call, if you know? I called a phone number that I was given. Where'd you get the phone number? It was either Jamie Masada or Luis Palenker. Did you dial the number? Yes. Was your mother with you? No. Was anybody in the background? Well, when I called him, I'm pretty sure that I was in the hospital. So either it could have been my dad, or maybe a nurse that would come in to do my vital signs or something. And you dialed the number, right? Yes. And do you have any idea who answered the phone? Answering machine. And did you ever actually get Mr. Leno on the phone? No. So you deny you've ever spoken to him on the phone, right? I've never spoken to Jay Leno. Well, even though the accuser denies talking to Jay Leno, Mesro continues to ask about the comedian. Okay. You never mentioned Mr. Leno to psychologist Stanley Katz, right? No, I don't think so. And you never mentioned Mr. Leno to Lieutenant Klapakis during any interview, correct? No, I've never mentioned Jay Leno to anybody except... I'm sorry? except for when they asked me what I know about Jay Leno. To your knowledge, did anybody in your family contact or try to contact Mr. Leno while you were ill? No, because I was the only one with the phone number. Did you ever give it to your mother? No. Ever give it to your father? No. Ever give it to Star? No. Ever give it to your sister, Davelin? Her name is Davelin, but no, I never gave it to her. Okay. 
You left a message on his machine, correct? Yes. Did you ever get a call back from anyone claiming they represented Mr. Leno? No. All right. So what you're saying is if anybody spoke to Mr. Leno and said they were you, it was certainly a false statement, right? Object as argumentative, Your Honor. Sustained. All right. Now, the point here, Ricky Kleeman, is that during the opening statement of the prosecutor, he mentions Jay Leno. And this, uh, this witness, this accuser, in his testimony, brings up Jay Leno. So was there any communication that shouldn't have happened between the prosecutor and this witness? Is it, is it worth even making? Oh, of course it's worth making. I think it's just a little subtlety on the part of Tom Mesero. What he's saying is... Listen, Jay Leno wasn't in this case until the prosecutor knew that I, Tom Mesero, was going to subpoena him to this court. And the reason, of course, that I'm subpoenaing him is because he is going to show that you're lying. So it's just that little subtle question that has a lot of context. But I got to say this, Mesero better deliver the goods. Yeah, you think he will? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Jay Leno obviously is on the witness list. And I'm presuming Mr. Mesero has spoken with him and knows what he's going to say. And also, apparently, uh, Gavin said these, uh, spoke about Mr. Leno to psychologists. Katz yes. and to Lieutenant Klopakis, who also are going to come in and say, yeah, he talked about yeah. Leno. Yeah, now how would explain... Lie, lie, lie. Or, yeah, yeah, or well. there's another side to that, though. There could be the side that Mesero says that he never spoke to anybody about Leno until he knew, and the prosecutor knew, that he that Mesero was subpoenaing Leno. Could mm -hmm. go either way, mm -hmm. I guess. Now, I'll explain mm -hmm. for us quickly with respect to Leno coming in. Does he have to come in? If he gets I, I, a subpoena, I was just going to make work? that point. There has been no motion to quash the subpoena that has been served on Mr. Leno. Now explain what you mean by quash. Well, uh, Mr. Leno could hire a lawyer. The lawyer could come in and ask the judge to prevent the, the defense from making Mr. Leno come to court. Right, because when you get served a subpoena, it's a court order. That's it says correct. you have to show up. And that hasn't been done, and I think that's very important. And Mr. Leno has plenty of opportunity to millions of people to say, in effect, he's been wrongfully subpoenaed and he's not going to come in. Secondly, this judge again sustained an objection by Mr. Snedden to the last question we just saw that Mr. Mesro asked, and I thought it was a perfectly appropriate question. It basically was, well, if it wasn't you that called and somebody used your name, they must have been lying. Well, yeah, but you know, that's argumentative. Howard, I come agree. on. <laughs> I was going to give that to you. You started off so well, but you lost me at the end. Next, how bad did the accuser feel when he thought Michael Jackson was ignoring him? Okay. Now, you complained to the Santa Barbara sheriffs that after I was done with my cancer stuff, you never saw Michael again, right? No, not until the Martin Bashir thing. Okay, and you wanted to see him after you were in remission, correct? Yes. You wanted to visit Neverland after you were in remission, right? Yes. And you felt in some way that Michael had cut off the friendship, right? Yes. You felt he had abandoned you, right? Yes. And you felt he had abandoned your family, right? Yes. But didn't you complain to the Santa Barbara sheriffs that after your cancer was over, Michael stopped communicating with you? It wasn't after my cancer. It was toward the beginning of my third chemotherapy round. You told them... After I was done with my cancer stuff, you couldn't call Michael anymore, right? I couldn't call Michael either at that period or the period when I had cancer. As if to prove Sean Chapman and Holly's point about motivation to lie in this lawsuit. A few minutes later, Mesro turns the cross-examination to the charge of false imprisonment. Okay, now, clearly during the last days at Neverland, you and your family, from what you say, wanted to leave, right? Well, my mom always wanted to leave. I wanted to stay because I was having lots of fun, but my mom was always really worried. Well, at some point you say you escaped from Neverland, right? Yes. You told the jury you escaped a couple of times before the final escape, which was when you left for good. Yes. Right? Yes. So what you are telling this jury is that after a couple of escapes and following your return from those escapes, you claim you were inappropriately touched. That's what you're saying, right? Object as argumentative, Your Honor. Overruled. All right, Sean Chapman Holly, since I picked on you a moment ago about having your point proven in this courtroom, I'm not going to let you answer that question anymore. But the idea of I was having fun at Neverland, therefore I didn't want to leave, but I was being abused or had been abused, that's a little bit of a 
Disconnect. I can't really get those two together. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Just like um, later, I guess we'll hear from the mother, either from Mr. Snedden or from Mr. Mesero, that she was falsely imprisoned, but yet was at the spa and getting the leg waxing. Another disconnect. It doesn't make sense. This isn't what you do if you were under these circumstances. It, and we have the, the whole problem, too, with this false imprisonment count, which is the one count that really, really bothers me, is again this whole issue we've been talking about, about time. We don't know because it's not set up. When is he having fun? Is he having fun five years ago? Is he having fun two years ago? When is he having fun? And that creates a disconnect, to use your word. It's a huge point, but Howard, let me play prosecutor that I, you know, bleed and love. Actually, yeah, you do a good For just job a moment. That. I do a pretty good job. Um, isn't it plausible that, again, you have a kid, if he's being molested or had been molested, and is going through this horrific chemotherapy treatment, he is so emotionally disconnected that he's having fun even though he may be being abused. Jane, and he I'll, wants to stay there. I, I'll tell you what bothers me the most. First of all, the, the ground rules keep changing. What do you mean? It's, well, because he's having fun, he's being molested. He, he goes whenever he wants, visits family, goes shopping, he's falsely but imprisoned. But it's the mind and, of a child, and, Howard. And what I find most offensive is I think they're using cancer as the hook for sympathy to the jury to ultimately get money. And yeah. that bothers me. And if the jury finds that, it's going to be problems for the prosecution. Well, ahead, a neverland of wine and bourbon and vodka and rum. Oh, my. Sorry for the pun, folks. Stay with us. The reenactments and commentary in this program may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back. Well, was it a perpetual happy hour at Neverland? According to the courtroom transcripts, here's what the jury heard. You've told the sheriffs that Michael Jackson would give you and your brother Bacardi, right? That was one of the things he gave us, yes. That was rum, right? Yes. And you also said he'd give you Sky Vodka, right? Yes. Jim Beam, which was bourbon, right? I don't know what it is, but yes. And red and white wine, right? Yes. Did you drink all this stuff at once? No, it was over the whole period of time that we were over there. Okay, but never once did you taste any of this stuff when Michael wasn't there? No. Okay, never took any alcohol out of the refrigerator in the kitchen, right? No. Never got caught taking alcohol out of the refrigerator in the kitchen, right? I never took any alcohol out of the refrigerator in the kitchen. To your knowledge, was your brother ever caught taking alcohol out of the refrigerator in the kitchen? I was always with him during the day, so no, he didn't. Would you agree that every time you were interviewed, your stories of drinking got worse and worse, correct? No. You initially told them you didn't drink a lot? That's true. Then you started telling them you drank a lot, and then you started telling them we drank every night, correct? Well, a lot would be every night, so it would really... Pardon me? A lot would be every night. And you're saying after Miami that you basically were drinking every single evening at Neverland, correct? No, I told him that every single evening that Michael was there in those transcripts, probably when I st still, I don't know. Isn't it true that every time you were interviewed, your stories of drinking got bigger and bigger and bigger? No. Are you saying your stories to the sheriffs were always consistent when it came to drinking? I'm pretty sure they are. I mean, it doesn't really matter whether I said that or not. I'm saying the fact is that we drank every night that Michael was there. Oh, but it does matter, and it does, does indeed. Well, as we move on, can you have a case of false imprisonment if nobody ever complains? Now, a programming note, mentioned in the testimony is Jesus Salas. He's the house manager at Neverland. After you say you escaped from Neverland the first time, you went to your grandparents, correct? Yes. And how did you get there? Jesus Salas drove us there. Do you recall anyone ever calling the police and saying, we've just been held against our will? No. Because, like, I, my mom was... Let me just ask you the questions, okay? Nobody did, right? No. A few days later, you went to, back to Neverland, right? I believe, yes. And then you say you escaped a second time, correct? Yes. And when you escaped the second time, how did you get out of Neverland? I don't know. Someone drove you somewhere, right? Yeah, probably. Did you go to your grandparents again? Probably. Nobody called the police from your grandparents when you say you escaped the second time, right? No. And then you claim you returned, right? Yes. And you say you finally escaped for good, right? 
Yes. And when you got back after finally escaping for good to your grandparents, nobody called the police, correct? No. Okay, okay, okay. Uncle, I'm going to tailgate on what Sean accused me of earlier, Ricky Cleveland, but I'm going to address it to you because I know you're going to be nicer to me than Sean would right now because she likes to gloat. I am indeed changing now from my accusation against Tom Mesro from yesterday. I thought he was too tough yesterday in the cross-examination that we heard, but now... I think he can be as tough as he wants to on this case. I'll tell you, I have gone on record in the past. You and I covered the Blake trial uh, or the Blake preliminary hearing. I have said that Tom Mesro is one of the finest cross examiners I have ever watched. I believed it then. I certainly believe it now. Tom Mesero's theory, which a lot of lawyers don't agree with, is to keep this boy on the witness stand as long as he can, explore everything that he right. can, yeah. and watch him break over and over again. Other lawyers wouldn't do it. I think Tom is right. Now, the idea, though, Howard Weitzman, is you've got this kid on the stand for a long time. Does it give us any insight as to whether or not Mesero will fulfill his I'm going to go ahead and call it a promise because he says contract in his opening statement as to whether or not Michael Jackson will get on the stand. Well, uh, does one have anything to do with the other? I can't predict that and I don't think it does. Okay. But I want to add something. Here's a question Tom Mesereau asked. Isn't it true that every time you were interviewed, your stories of drinking got bigger and bigger and bigger? Let me say what's getting bigger and bigger and bigger is this witness's nose as he tells <laughs> each The old Pinocchio lie. analogy. Certainly, certainly that's got to be something that, Sean, this jury is picking up on. And I can't help but also, I hate giving you, giving you points, Sean, but i got to do, do it do again. It. Does the discipline <laughs> problem, days. I know, this is Sean's day. We're going to call this Sean Day today. <laughs> Thank you. Do the discipline problems translate into, yeah, this is a kid, because he was a knucklehead in school, is somebody who would go drink on his own. Yes, yes. And as uh, Ricky mentioned, we've got former teachers on the jury. They're taking note of all of this. I understand that the jurors are paying close attention, taking careful notes. Yeah. You know, I'm happy to hear that because it's a very conservative jurisdiction. And I'm happy to see that they're paying attention to what this witness is saying and taking notes when they see he's caught in lies. Yeah, and going back to the tenor of Tom Mesro having actually gone to the courthouse yesterday and sat in the listening room, I can tell you that Tom Mesro seems to be becoming more and more calm as this mm -hmm. witness becomes more and more frail. Next, is the defense attorney Tom Mesro setting the stage for motive? A motive for the accuser, not the accused. And what you're saying is that after your interview with the social workers, where you were asked questions about Michael Jackson, you're saying it was after that that inappropriate touching began, correct? Yes. While Mr. Jackson is being investigated by Los Angeles County, true? It it didn't happen until the last few weeks before I left, or two weeks, somewhere around there. Well, let me ask the question again. Okay. The three social workers were from Los Angeles County, true? I think they were. And they were asking you questions about whether Mr. Jackson had ever inappropriately touched you, correct? Yes. And you said no, right? Yes. You knew they were investigating Mr. Jackson, right? No. I thought they were just going to try to ask me, and that was it. I didn't know. But what you're telling the jury is that after this investigation starts and after you and your family are questioned, Mr. Jackson supposedly starts touching you inappropriately, right? Yes. Until you realized you were not going to be part of Michael Jackson's family, you never made any allegation of child molestation, correct? I didn't want to be part of his family. I just saw him as a father figure. Until you realized Michael Jackson was not going to meet you in Brazil, you never made any allegation of child molestation, right? I didn't even really want to go to Brazil. Until you left Neverland for the last time, you never made any allegation of child molestation, correct? I didn't tell anyone until I left for the last time, correct? And never called the police until after you'd seen two lawyers, right? Object as argumentative, Your Honor. Overruled. Yes. It wasn't until I saw two lawyers, until I told the police, what really happened. All right, Howard Weitzman, I know you probably want to say this for me. Game over now? Well, I don't know if the game's over. You never know what's coming. But I, I think this cred the credibility of this young man is over. I think it's sad. I think it's a shame. I think he's been used, in my opinion, by the prosecution in part and Tom Stedden's zealousness 
to uh, to get Michael and Jackson. And is that going to go back on the prosecutor? I got on that one. Well, you don't he's have be, to. He's perhaps, <laughs> been used, he has perhaps been used by his mother. When this case comes into Snedden's office, he can't just escort it out the door. Well, oh, but, but he's no. waiting for it. To it. He's test, so though. excited about you put it. it. Well, we don't know how he's reacting. In fairness to Tom Snedden, <clears> again, <throat> we don't know how he reacted. We don't know if he's salivating, if he's trying to be as objective as he can. Certainly, I can envision a prosecutor who is simply torn. You've got a bunch of things operating. One, you've got accusations swirling. You've got a case that the accuser from 1993 bowed out on, and apparently Tom Stanton didn't have enough uh, information to go forward, plus that pesky little civil procedure code that doesn't allow you, in cases of a sexual assault victim, to proceed and put them on the stand when they don't want to go. James, if you go back to the initial press conference, Tom exactly. Stanton's attitude and exactly. what he said and how he acted, That's right. that says it all. How so? Right. What do you mean? Expand on it. Well, expand on it. He was gloating. He was salivating. He in, made jokes. I mean, effect. it was a yeah. very yeah. inappropriate. And he actually did come out, and he did. He, he actually did come out, and I don't know if a full apology well, is really the term, but he came out and addressed that issue. He had to. And you know what? I'll say this in Tom Snedden's defense. Oh boy, watch out, Tom. There's Here it comes. no question in my mind that he believes that this is true. Yes. He believes it's true. He believes Michael Jackson is yes. a child molester, but that's clouding his vision and, and his view. And certainly, as a former California as a prosecutor. prosecutor, I can tell you that it is not enough to believe that the crime was committed. You must, you must be convinced that you can prove it in a court beyond a reasonable doubt. Still ahead. Who is the mysterious witness the defense is asking about? And will this provide more shockers for an already electric trial? Stay with us. Uh, good afternoon. Um I'm here to announce, as you probably all know by now, that we filed formal charges of felony criminal complaint against Mr. Jackson. The reenactments and commentary in this program may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back. Defense attorney Tom Mesro goes on to interrogate the accuser about a possible mystery witness, at least a witness whose name we haven't heard up to this point. Here's what happened according to the courtroom transcripts. Do you know someone named Rio? I think he was a little kid that was there for a while. When did you first meet Rio? I don't remember. But do you remember seeing Rio at Neverland? Yeah, he stood there for like a week or... Did you stay in a guest house with Rio? No. Ever remember stealing alcohol from Michael Jackson's bedroom when Rio was present? No. Do you recall stealing a $1,000 laminated bill from Michael's room? A $1,000 bill. That was laminated? Do they make $1,000 bills? Did you ever steal one? No. Ever recall masturbating in front of Rio? No. Now, Ricky Cleveland, I was actually in the listening room of the courthouse when this particular portion of testimony was played. There was laughter, at least, in the listening room. I don't know if it happened in the courtroom, but it seemed to be a genuine, they make $1,000 bills coming from this kid. Well, it, it may be a genuine, and perhaps there is a laminated bill that he did steal because, obviously, Mesero has a basis to believe that or he couldn't ask the question. Yeah, he must. Um, and, and it sounds like all of this comes from this kid named Rio, who I guess is another witness we're going to hear testify, right. who was a little boy, it sounds like. Uh, that uh, that this young man, this accuser, uh, did or talked about or masturbated in front of. I mean, that's powerful evidence. That's very, very powerful. Now, Howard, I really want to hear what you have to say right about now because you got a bone to pick with my good buddy, Sean. Thank you, James. Well, I, <laughs> I wouldn't be that uh, direct. However, um, I do believe Tom Snedden thinks Michael Jackson is a child molester. I don't believe Tom Snedden really thinks this child was a victim. I think he's using him as a vehicle. If he just takes a minute to look at all the evidence, it's clear as it unfolds, and he knows much more than we do. Wait, that, 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 this this is saying. a very shaky case. He can't I, be clear. He's clouded. He's clouded. He can't see clearly now because he's just so motivated they, by this they, zealousness. They, they called right. over 40 witnesses in front of this grand jury, and you bet that we're going to hear from most, if not all of them. This is not the whole case, because the question is, how is it corroborated? Where is the alcohol? What do we find in the search warrants? Maybe the masturbation is not corroborated, but if everything else is, he thinks he's got all a case. Right. 
right, we're going to have to leave it right there. We'll pick it up tomorrow, be sure, and watch us tomorrow. Our exclusive one-hour edition of the Michael Jackson trial coverage, 9 p.m., right here on E. See you then. Let's go. And so there's the crime.